for the after lunch track, the fitting topic, uh, Hunting Crypto Secrets in SAP Systems by Martin Gallo from Core Security. So please give him a warm welcome. All right. Uh, well, th thank you all for, for coming to the talk. Um, the presentation is called Handing Crypto Secrets in SAP Security uh, and kind of follows what I presented last year here um, uh, related to all the crypto layer for SAP systems. After my talk, I have a lot of people uh, coming to me and ask me questions about some of the uh, things related to what I presented. And one of the things that I identified was that there were a lot of, a lot of misunderstanding or a lot of uh, lack of knowledge on how uh, the crypto libraries in SAP system protect the secrets, right? So I wanted to like follow on, on this topic and uh, the results uh, is why I will be sharing today. Uh, I'm Martin Gasho. Um, I work on my day to day as a product owner for core security. So we have a, we are a software company. We build uh, security solutions. So I work on, on, on the PM uh, side of the organization. But also, I always like to have some time to play with things. Uh, and that's what I uh, call myself also as a security researcher, right? Uh, when it's not my full uh, daytime job, uh, I still enjoy doing it and presenting what uh, I can come up with. So. The agenda is kind of straightforward. Uh, I would like to begin with the definition of the problem uh, that I saw and that I uh, tried to solve <laughs> at some point. Um, I will give a quick review on what is the cryptographic material that uh, SAP systems might have around. And then we will enter into the details of uh, what the personal security environment uh, is. Uh, what are the SSO credentials that SSCP uses uh, and the local protection store. After that, I will try to like wrap everything, uh, put everything together and show some attack vectors uh, and some things related to that. Um, and end up with some recommendations on how to better configure or how to handle uh, all the crypto material in, in SAP systems. Um, and then with some uh, quick conclusions on, on, on the topic. So as a Disclaimer, uh, first I want to say that I will not present any new vulnerability. There will not be any fancy demos or exploits or things like that. But my goal with this talk is mostly to uh, like share with everyone what I learned, uh, understanding how these mechanisms works. Uh, I'm a true believer that if you need to, if you want to secure something, uh, uh, in a good way, you need to know how it works. Uh, so this is kind of uh, in, in that direction, right? So the problem, uh, we know that SAP systems handles a lot of sensitive data. Uh, there are a lot of critical business process going on on these systems. Um, and also there are a lot of policies uh, driven by security itself, but also by regulations and by compliance uh, that requires uh, and put a lot of pressure on actually securing all these business processes and all these business data, right? So that, that's a true problem. We have been like discussing around this, uh, and this is why we are all here, right? Um, re in particular, related to securing the business process and securing the data, the main solution is just use crypto, right? So there's a big movement all over the place to encrypt everything, encrypt all the data, encrypt uh, all the data at transit and at rest. So all the communication paths, but also um, how the information is stored in the different databases and things like that. There's also a, a lot of movement on, on having a strong authentication mechanisms. So in the last few years, we, we uh, I mean, we saw a, a big switch uh, shift into using uh, like password-based authentication into things like uh, multi-factor, single sign-on, and all that stuff. So uh, that's also one of the things that crypto can help on, on, uh, on solve. Um, also integrity protection, making sure that the things you are seeing are the ones that are supposed to, to, to be there and nobody can touch or tamper with, with the data. Um, and this is a signature that is important in this case because the business processes sometimes require uh, like a, um, 
having di digital signatures in, in, in different places, right? So there's already a solution there. Uh, we have been talking uh, a lot uh, around this. Uh, and it's kind of clear that there's a path on how to go into securing the processes and the data. The thing is that this brings a new problem, which is, OK, now that you have crypto all over the place, you need to think how to secure the crypto material, right? It's not that the problem is completely solved. So you encrypt things, but OK, what's the key that you use to encrypt that? So you now have to protect that material, right? And this is where this talk Kensu, uh, and there are three different things. First is that this data is as same as sensitive as the data that we are protecting, or sometimes even more, because the same keys might be using for s encrypting and securing a lot of different things. Um, another of the challenges is that all the system processes that are running on, on every system, and this is not something related to SAP, but in general, needs to have this cryptographic material available because they need it to start the processes and to decrypt it or encrypt it, right? So this is something that needs to be available for the system itself at some level, right? Um, and if you look at it from a, like an attacker standpoint, this is definitely uh, like a high value, uh, high value thing to, to, to consider. So this is like the problem definition that I, I tried to start uh, like solving or, or shedding some light into how you can uh, make things a, a little bit better um, around it. So cryptographic material, right? So what is the cryptographic material in SAP environments, right? What might be the different things we need to take care of uh, related to, to crypto? So to start with that first, uh, I would like to like give a, an overview of what are the cryptographic libraries that are available in subsystems? The main one is the common cryptolive. Uh, I will talk more a little bit about that. Um, and for different use cases, like for example, protecting communication channels uh, for digital signature and encryption of data at rest, uh, for authentication and things like that, is like the main library that you can use. For some particular things, you can also use OpenSSL. Um, so if you look like at the whole SAP landscape, I would say that probably most of the crypto is done using the common crypto leaf. Uh, and there might be some minor pieces that are using OpenSSL. OpenSSL is a standard open source uh, library, so it's very well known in the industry, in the market. Uh, in SAP, is used for TLS and for securing communications on HTTPS, mostly on Subhana and some business objects. I know also I was trying to look for, for, for other places where you can use OpenSSL, and it might be that there are some more products uh, around that, that, that uses, but those are like the, the main ones. But the thing is that OpenSSL like, is a standard, it's open source, it uses some standard protocols, uh, so it's kind of very well know uh, how the library protects the, the crypto secrets, right? There are a lot of uh, standards defined, uh, like PKCS. Uh, I mean, all, all, all things that you can do are almost done in the same way that in some other standard uh, products or, or systems that you might have. So I will not focus on, on this particular library, um, because I, I think that there's enough information around um, and I don't think that I, I will add any, any value if, if we enter in this. And also on, on SAP HANA in the latest versions, uh, SAP started to deprecate the use of OpenSSL. So everything seems to be uh, like moving into using common cryptolive. The common cryptolive is the standard library for all SAP components. So it's like the default library that you use on SAP Weaver, on SAP HANA, uh, and all the auxiliary components, uh, services, all the tools. Uh, almost every system I, uh, that I saw at some point uses this library. I think it makes sense because it's a way to standardize the, the, the use of this, right? And it replaced all the old libraries. So in the past, there, um, there used to be like 
different cryptographic libraries going around. Uh, first on the early ages, uh, the ones from, from Secure, which is a, like a German company that developed the first uh, toolkits around it. Uh, then there was the sub security library or sub uh, the sub crypto lib that was only used for some use cases, but not for everything. Um, and basically, starting on 2012, SAP merged all together. Uh, and decided to have a, a unique standard cryptographic library for all the purposes, right? So this makes things a little bit easier, um, at least nowadays. It might be that in some SAP systems, there are still some copies of the legacy libraries, uh, but this is full backwards compatible, so uh, the idea is that everyone can move into this new library without having any potential issue issue around, right? Uh, the library is also FIPS uh, compatible, so this means that the, some regulations on, on the US uh, like federal space can be made using this, uh, so it's, I mean, th this is a good, good uh, reason uh, for using it versus maybe other cryptographic libraries, uh, at least for those type of customers or, or, or um, Companies, companies, enterprises. <laughs> um, and also, it can be used as an interface for hardware security modules. So if you want to have all your uh, security keys stored in a hardware device or things like that, this library can provide this interface also for, for, for doing it. So uh, the use cases, as I said before, communication paths. So you can use the common crypto leave for authenticating and encrypting traffic using HTTPS, using SNNC for some of the proprietary protocols. Um, for example, on, on SOBO web services, you can use it to, to implement uh, WS security and either encrypt or sign the, the web service requests. Uh, another big use case is on authentication. So the library is also used to um, implement the single sign-on on the SAP GUI staff uh, um, and, and all that thing, uh, SAML, uh, JSON Web Tokens, SAP Logon, Kerberos, SPNego, I mean, everything that has to do with authentication and, and, and where crypto is involved uses this library. And also another important thing is that this is also used as part of the, some of the business processes for digital signature and encryption, right? So there are a lot of places within all the SAP offering, uh, where you can use this, for example, to encrypt data into the SAP database itself, or for example, to uh, produce or, or generate digital signatures of some transactions and things like that, right? So th there are a lot of valid use cases for um, protecting data inside the SAP itself. Uh, I don't know, HR data, uh, intellectual property, I mean, there are things you can, uh, credit cards uh, and all that stuff. So all that is using the same cryptographic library, right? So if we recap on all these um, different use cases and what means to have cryptographic material, I, I will like split it in three different categories, but basically you have a lot of things that have to do with passwords, with handle uh, authentication, and how you um, like provide the, the authentication to, to the different systems and how, how that information is stored in, in the different places where, where it might be stored. Uh, there is all related to PKI and certificates and all the keys related. So some of these technologies, HTTPS, SNNC, SSF, I mean, all of that at some point uses some form of certificates and keys uh, for encrypting and signing and, and all performing all the cryptographic operations. And finally, there are private kits that are meant more to uh, like is protect data at rest uh, that are the ones uh, in the right uh, in, in the private keys category. So I think it's great that the, the, the previous talk uh, like shows some, some of the stuff related to the uh, Java secure storage and things like that. I will not enter neither on the password or, nor on the private keys side of it. Uh, this is, I mean, there might be things that are still unknown, but it's a uh, 
thing that was very well researched. There are a lot of material around on how, for example, the passwords are, are stored, how you can decrypt uh, uh, all, all the things if you get access to, to the actual hashes and things like that. As I say, the secure storage for ABAP and Java is, is also, um, I really know how to, how you can uh, break it or, or decrypt the data if you have the right key. So I would just point out that uh, the ERP, ERP scan uh, presentation on 2014 uh, called All Your Passwords Long to Us covers almost all this stuff uh, in regards to passwords and, and private keys secure storage and, and all that stuff. So there might be things that are still missing, but it, it's kind of a already well-known uh, uh, area. So I will focus this talk on the like column in the middle uh, and how the cryptographic library protects all the certificates and keys for, for those different use cases, right? And to start with that, uh, I will introduce uh, the personal security environment uh, concept and the, the PCA. Um, so this is basically the way the common crypto leaf stores all the objects that the library needs to deal with. Um, so basically all the certificates, all the private keys, uh, the revocations list, I mean, all things that you need to implement some of those use cases and, and use all those technologies like SNNC, HTTPS, and things like that uh, are using this format as a way to store uh, all, all this data, right? So this is uh, a file format that was defined a lot of years ago uh, as part of Secute. Uh, I, I learned this just doing this research. Um, Secute, not a company, but the, there was uh, some kind of a standard. Uh, I think it was sponsored by the German government at some point or things like that, uh, where they define a, a set of uh, like cryptographic standards on how to do some, some of this stuff. It's similar to PGCS uh, 12, but it's not the same. So that's where things get uh, a little bit interesting. So it offers a lot more things on that, that PGCS uh, 12. Um, and if I had to put like everything on, on a diagram, I would say that if we have uh, an SAP system, uh, like on the left there, these PCI objects are somewhere stored either in the database or in the file system. Uh, and I would call this PCI as a kind of a vault where you store all the private keys and certificates and things like that. By default, these PCI files are stored protected with a PIN. So the idea is that in order to get that information, you authenticate with it uh, somehow, right? Um, we will go deep into, into that uh, later. So secured. Uh, as I said, this, is, this was developed a lot of years ago uh, by an institution called GMD. Uh, it's kind of a general proposed security tool uh, that was meant to be portable and things like that. It defines several uh, like libraries and utilities and standards uh, for, for how to deal with all crypto. It includes the definition of the PCA uh, and provides some ASNM1 definitions as a, 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 and as well a, a reference implementation in, in, in C, in the C language, right? So if you look at this uh, thing, we can learn, for example, how some of the parts of the PCA files are, are being constructed. So this is kind of open. Uh, I, I learned it the hard way because I started first to, to take a look at uh, um, like from, from looking at it from the other side, and then I found that there were some documents published on how the PCI uh, file format uh, was initially defined and things like that. So there are a lot of things that you can learn if, if you download that, that stuff. Um, okay, so where we can find PCI files? Uh, I would say that the main sources of this would be definitely the file system. So on every SAP system that uses crypto at some level, uh, there will be probably files containing all the private keys and certificates. Uh, so these are like the default places where you can uh, look for, for this type of files. In particular, in Subnet Weaver uh, AVAP, the PCIs are also stored in the database. Um, 
and well, those are the tables where, where they are stored. Uh, but one interesting thing is that the Netweaver uh, ABAP system takes care of synchronizing what is in the file system with what is in the database. So it's, if you change something, at some point it should uh, be reflected or, or on, the other, on the other side. Uh, and this also means that if it's in the database, it gets somehow replicated to all the different application servers within the same system, right? So this is kind of distributed all over the SAP landscape. Uh, and, and this makes it also I interesting. Um, on SAP HANA, starting with the SPS 10, they switch from using only file system to store the, the PCI files to support in database storage. So now if you need to configure, uh, I don't know, SSL, TLS, uh, you need to provide all the certificates and the private keys by using PCF files in the database is, in, in itself, and it gets stored in the database, right? So this is also interesting. And there are some statements for dealing with that, and there are some particular views and tables that you can use to uh, either look at or, or retrieve um, like all this, all this data. So, Okay, the file format. Uh, there are two versions of this file format. Uh, the one is V2. I don't know where it was born. <laughs> so I guess that is since the, the beginning of the times. And version two that was added in 2007 to the, uh, at that time, the sub crypto uh, library. Um, by default, the library is still using V2, like as, as, the, as the standard one, uh, but you can specify if you want to use the, the before or, or, or not. Uh, the file format is based on ASIN and one uh, structure. So this is kind of a language where you can define and describe how a particular uh, file or a particular string is, is built. So it, it's like a declarative language that is used to, to define all, all these type of things. There are a lot of crypto that is based on, on these same structures. Um, in general, it's pin protected. So you need to uh, like provide a pin to access the information that is inside a file. Um, and it's encrypted using some standard PKCS algorithms and mechanisms, right? Uh, there are three ways of defining it, uh, of, of, of encrypting it, using like two variants of, of, of some of the PKCS um, standards. And optionally, uh, in the latest versions of Common CryptoLib, you can also use something that is called the local protection storage, uh, and I will go into more details on that uh, later, but it's like an additional layer of protection for, for these files, right? The thing is that the strength of how this is encrypted depends on the pin that the user provides, right? So we, we have some discussions, right? But if you, if you hear, oh, this is protected by a pin, the, the first talk that you have is, oh, okay, this is a four D sheet or something like that, right? And the key here is that the complexity and all the strength of how this is encrypted depends on, on, on that pin, right? So that's also important to, to, to keep in mind. Uh, this is just for reference. We, I, I don't want to go into too much detail on the full format, but I wanted to have it here in the slides for, for like further reference. But this is like the, the main format of, of the PCF files. There's first a version uh, field that says if you are on, on B2 on B4, and based on that, you have different structures for how, how things are, are, are like construct. Uh, the PCI file itself, uh, it has a big chance of encrypted data. Um, in particular, there's the pin encrypted there uh, on B2 or on B4. Is not, the pin is not stored encrypted, but uh, an HMAC is stored there. There's a piece that defines which encryption algorithm is being used. And then you have the ciphertext, which is like the content of the whole PCI file encrypted with this pin, right? So this kind of repeats for the two different versions. Um, when you decrypt it, basically what you get is uh, again, a, a, an algorithm definition of what the encryption was. You got a time tab of the last time it, the file was, was modified. Uh, there are some fields that 
I don't really know what, what they mean because they are not used. And then you have a set of different PCI objects. This PCI object is what differs this file format from PKCS uh, uh, 12 because all these different PCI objects are, are like different, right? And, and th this is something that is not common on, on the other standards, right? But basically, there are different object types that you can use for different purposes. For example, the ESCII new, ESCII old, uh, decryption, ESCII new, and, and all the first box there uh, is what you use to store the subject, what is called the subject keys. Uh, then you have another type of object for storing the certificates that you either use for encryption or for signing. Uh, you have a private key root, which is like the private key for the entire uh, PCF file, like the, the owner, the, the private key of the owner of the PCF file, and so on and so on, right? So there are a lot of specific things um, that are well defined on the secured, uh, like standard. Um, so I, I will not go into more detail, but just to let that this is all different type of data that might be get stored into the, the PCI files, right? It's not just certificates and private keys, but there might be also some other type of data that uh, depend on, on what you need might be uh, get stored there, right? Okay, so I told that this uses uh, like an encryption algorithm. I took a look at how this encryption was implemented. This is basically uh, using PSF1 uh, with triple DES and SHA-1. This is like a standard encryption algorithm that is defined on the PKCS12 uh, standard. Um, so there's nothing more fancy to, to, to look here. Uh, the only thing is that, uh, as I said before, for version 2, the pin is stored encrypted in the uh, file itself, and in order to decrypt it, you need to know the ping, right? But uh, this is something that in general is not recommended because it's allow you to, to make tracking uh, a little bit easier. On the, if you choose to use the other uh, encryption algorithms, which are the, the, the ones at the, at the bottom, um, the encryption is even more modern <laughs> and using PKCI uh, uh, 5. Uh, which is like the most current way of, of, of storing this, this type of data. So uh, if I put everything together, I would say that these are like the three main encryption mechanisms that PCI files offer. Um, there's something important here that the encryption needs to be slow enough for make the cracking a little bit more difficult. So one of the parameters that you use when you encrypt this is the iterations, the amount of times you iterate over the, the key, right? Uh, well, as you will see in the first uh, row, um, inversions before August uh, 2017, uh, the default iteration was kind of a low number, which is not recommended enough. Um, and also, it was the only encryption mechanism available, right? So starting uh, with 8.5.15 uh, version of the common cryptolib, you have also the other two encryption mechanisms available, which are more stronger. Uh, it also changes the default iterations for everything, so it makes things, uh, I mean, a lot better in terms of the, the encryption strength that is provided on, for, for the PCF files, right? So, I think that this kind of summarizes um, what are the, the, the mechanisms in place, right? But as I said before, one of the key challenges of using and adopting crypto is that, let's say that we encrypt all our keys using this format. We provide a very strong ping, uh, like a very strong random value as a ping for encrypt everything. How the system managed to boot and to start if there's no one like introducing the pin, right? So that's one of the things. I, I, don't, I don't want my SAP system to depend on someone entering and manually introducing the pin, right? So SAP came up with uh, what is called the SSO credentials. Uh, that is a mechanism uh, aimed at, at solving this, this problem, right? So the idea is that 
by using this, you have a, some kind of single sign-on experience for working and dealing with PCF files. Basically means that it stores the pins to decrypt all the PCI files in some place. And when a system needs to decrypt it for, for example, reading the certificates or things like that, it uses this mechanism. So there's uh, no requirement for someone introducing manually the pin, right? Um, this is also a file that is stored somewhere in the system. Uh, it's also defined as a SNM.1 structure. Uh, and it's meant to be encrypted for the current user. The idea is that you log in in one system as an as a operating system user, uh, and you define and provide a pin, and that pin gets stored and is tied to the user uh, that was used to, to create it, right? It uses different encryption mechanisms. We will go into this. And also, uh, the local protection storage mechanism can be used on, on this. Um, I will like go deep into that later on, but um, it, it's also important. Again, to like clarify and to sum up, this means that if this file is not protected in a right way, it renders all the PCI encryption useless because here's the pin for decrypting all the other stuff, right? So it's kind of, you need to chain both things together to, to, to understand that this is also a key part of all the, all the process. Um, going to, to the same diagram, uh, what this mechanism add is a different way for the PCF files to be decrypted. In this case, using uh, the SSO credentials. So you can either manually edit or access the PCF files providing the pin, or you can use the SSO credential mechanism uh, and everything works magically. So there are different versions of this file format or, or used for different things. I think that this probably has been changed uh, across the years. Uh, what I call the version O or version zero um, is the default that was being used um, before August 2017. Um, the pin is encrypted with uh, triple test, which is a, a standard algorithm, but it's considered not secure enough. So I think this is one of the reasons why in the latest version you have new, new options available, new algorithms. And the encryption key is obtained from a hard-coded screen in the common CryptoLib binary uh, that is format with the username, right? So the only thing you need to know for decrypting this type of SSO credentials is the username, right? So if you got access to the file and you know the username uh, that was used initially, you can decrypt it, right? Uh, the string is hard coded in, in, the, uh, in the library, so it's something that you, you can take off. Um, the file format is basically this. The file contains a set of different credentials. Each credential has a certificate name, which is like the, the um, uh, like the common name for, for, for the PCI that you are protecting. There's a string that I think is, is not being used. Then there's the path of the PSC file. And finally, the, what is called the cipher uh, string. Um, when you provide that username uh, and apply the proper algorithm, you decrypt that and you get this plain credential structure that basically has the pin uh, as a first uh, field, and then you have different options uh, that are also optional, right? So depending on uh, how the pin was defined and things like that, you get different different things. But it's basically a one-step process of for decrypting it, right? Um, as I said, the algorithm is pretty simple. There's no initialization vector on the triple DS um, encryption. The key is a fixed key that it gets format against the username. And by format, I mean like in C, in the C language, when you format a string, uh, you do a printf or things like that. So it's basically replacing two characters of the uh, default fixed key with the username. And that get caught on the 24 uh, characters also. So th that's what is used as a key for encrypting this. So it's pretty straightforward, pretty easy to decrypt also if you get access to the file. So in particular, for Windows platforms, 
the common cryptolib by default uses a different mechanism. So even what, when it's using this same uh, version O format, if you are on Windows, by default it uses the DP uh, API. DP is a data protection API uh, that is like a mechanism that Windows offers to encrypt and decrypt stuff. Um, the algorithm and the key derivation on the first step is exactly the same one uh, as before, but the thing is that what you got after you, de you decrypt that is something that you need to then provide to the data protection API for having the actual pin, right? So now we have one step more that is like relying on a Windows service or Windows API for encrypting everything. Um, so this is a good thing. The Windows EPE, uh, API is basically a, a, an old service that is being provided by Windows. It has many changes over the years, uh, but it's actually been uh, Develop. Uh, it continues to be developed in Windows, so it's kind of a standard. It's considered strong in general. Uh, there were some attacks in 2012 uh, and 2000 um, between 2010 and 2012, but it's kind of considered secure. Uh, the thing is that this relies on having access to the Windows user account, right? So if you have access to the user account on at the operating system level, you can use this service to encrypt and decrypt the stuff. But if you take, for example, this SSO credential file outside of the box where it was uh, like used, it's not as straightforward to do some uh, decryption of it, right? So it's kind of considered strong. There are some attacks being announced around this, uh, I think for the next months. Um, so we will see if it continues to be strong or not, but so far with the information that, that we have, I think that it, it can be considered a, a, like a secure enough uh, way of retaining data. Um, this is an example of one of the tools, but let's say that you decrypt the one credential file using the mechanism that I showed before, what you get is instead of the plain pin, what you get is this blob of uh, like this large string, string with some data that is what you need to provide to the DP uh, API to get the actual pin decrypted, right? There are some tools available, so you can play with it. And for example, if you are in the same machine with the same user account, you can use a tool to uh, copy and paste that string and decrypt it to the actual pin that is there, right? So, but again, this is relying on the Windows uh, user account, uh, and if you don't have access to the keys of that user account, is not something that you can easily uh, like decrypt, right? So the file format in this case, uh, and just again for reference and to summarize, after you decrypt the SSO file, instead of getting the pin directly, what you get is another structure that has the encryption blob. Um, instead of what was in the previous slide called the pin. Uh, and in the first option field, you get a string that denotes which was the provider user for, for encrypting this, right? Uh, and if you use the DP API, you can decrypt and, and have the actual pin uh, available. So the algorithm is described as, as, as here. Um, again, the initial derivation of the key is, is the same. It's a fixed key with the username, but you have one step more uh, in order to, to decrypt it using the DB um, API. So the new formats, uh, as I say, starting uh, on 2017, there are like new ways, two new ways to, to, to um, encrypt the, the SSO credential files. This is basically uh, configurable on, on the CCL um, profile. Uh, and the pin gets encrypted either using triple this or IH, which is like a more strong or more standard encryption algorithm. The encryption key is still obtained from like a hard-coded key. It goes through some process for being derivated uh, using SHA and using a XOR uh, script, uh, like a XOR function. Um, 
and the sub and the initialization vector is also stored in the credential. So if you take a look here, we have like in this file format, new file format, we have even more data um, and, and some new fields, uh, like a field to specify the algorithm, the sub, the initialization vector, and things like that. But again, this is still relying on some hard-coded keys in the, in the common cryptolib. Um, the algorithm is described as, as, as this. Uh, the, dedication, the derivation of the key is some like custom-made function uh, that does some really strange things, but basically it applies some SHA-256 uh, operations and a XOR with a key also hard-coded, uh, and basically you get uh, something that you use to decrypt the encrypted pin, and then you go through a new XOR function uh, operation to, to get the actual pin. But basically, it's something that you can definitely decrypt if you get access to the SSO file and you know the, the, the username, right? So this is like a summary of the different protection mechanisms. I, I will highlight that in this case, the stronger one is still using the old format but on a Windows-based machine because that's relying on having access to the user account to protect everything. So if you take out the file outside the box where it was uh, initially created, you cannot decrypt it easily, right? So you need to go through some cracking process or, or things like that. So I would say that even the newer um, algorithms are, are not that strong. Uh, as maybe using um, the other one in Windows. For Linux platform, there's, there's nothing uh, uh, like available um, for that. If you need to have a, like a additional level of protection, either for the PCF files or for the credential files, uh, there's something that is called the local protection store. Right, so this was introduced, I don't know when, at, at, at which time, on, in which version of the sub lib. I tried to read all the release notice, but couldn't find it. But basically, it's, again, advanced mechanism for both the credentials and the PCF files. Um, it works on three different ways. So on Windows, there's an option to use the DPAP as well. Um, on Linux, you can use a TPM provider. So let's say that you have a TPM chip on your machine, on your server, uh, you can use the TPM to store or to perform all the crypto operations. Um, and if you are on a Linux machine and there's no TPM available or the libraries are not available or things like that, uh, it fallbacks to some mechanism that is called internal or fallback. Um, that we, we will see some, some de details about, right? So this is kind of the, the three different ways you, you can configure. So if we add this LPS mechanism to, to like the diagram, we know now that the PCF files can be protected using LPS and did this came either from the Data Protection API or the TPM, and the same applies to the SSO credentials, right? So there's an additional layer that you can use on both type of files to protect all this. Um, the fallback mode is the weakest one because it basically means that there's no external service or things that the system can use to, to securely store uh, like crypto material. So it's basically, um, the pin gets encrypted using um, a key that is, again, hard-coded. It goes through some derivation process, but it's something that is still on the common crypto leaf and anyone can grab it. Um, the DPA or the APA, uh, the DPA or the TPM modes uh, are a lot more stronger. Uh, they basically rely on having the encryption key storing some of these services uh, or, or APIs, right? So I would say that this is a stronger mechanism to protect PCA or, or, or SSO files. On Windows, using the data protection uh, API, or on TPM, uh, or Linux, using a TPM chip or, or something similar. Uh, the format, it gets a little bit more mess, but let's say that we have a credential file uh, which has a set of credentials, and in each credential on the cipher field, 
uh, what you get when you look uh, into the details is like a new structure uh, that defines all the things related to the LPS, um, the version, the type, context, restriction. You can say this is only for uh, user X, uh, and the coding in the library is uh, in charge of checking which user is accessing and things like that. There's an encrypt key stored there, and then you have like the encrypt data itself. And everything is wrapped and, and protected with some HMAC and, and checksums, uh, mostly, I guess, for integrity or things like that. So using LPS, you basically decrypt the key. And after you get the key, you can decrypt using the standard mechanism. You can decrypt uh, the entire encrypted data and get, for example, the pin. Um, PCFIs is the same, right? So instead of having the pin, what you get after all the, the compression uh, process is that you get the, the PCA content in, in plain, right? Uh, with all the private keys and, and the certificates and everything. So this is like the overview of the algorithm. It's pretty straightforward. The important thing here is that the key is obtained using this uh, LPS decryption mechanism. In the fallback mode, as I said, um, this is basically relying on some fixed key that are der derived uh, using some standard operations. Uh, and it's also pretty straightforward to, to implement or, or, or to, to use somehow. So LPS as a whole, uh, I would say that we have, I mean, all these three methods of, or modes of work. Uh, I consider the DP and the TPM the strongest ones uh, because they rely on on, on actual uh, like uh, keys being stored somewhere else outside the file. Uh, for the fallback mode, uh, I will say that this is is probably not not that much uh, secure. Um, but the the key takeaway is that there are some mechanisms that are a little bit stronger uh, that maybe can provide some good level of of security uh, for this type of of stuff. Um, so if we put everything together, basically let's, let's imagine that we have an attacker that is able to obtain some of these PCI files. And there might be many means of, of obtaining them, right? So as I said before, uh, this gets stored in the database. So it might be that, for example, a SQL injection vulnerability allows you to grab these type of files or a path traversal vulnerability like the one uh, uh, that was shown in, in, the previous, um, in the previous presentation allows you to read some files uh, in the system. So you can basically have a way to grab all these PCF files. Uh, or because the sysadmin or the basis admin didn't take the proper uh, care of, of, of the files when, when handled them, right? Uh, but let's say that you don't have the SSO credentials available. So this is encrypted using a pin that you don't know. Um, what I uh, show here is that there's a way to still get access to this. If the PCI is not protected using LPS, uh, you can basically like crack it, crack the pin uh, using some brute forcing on, or dictionary attacks. If the PCI is protected with LPS, um, you might need to have like two different, two different additional steps to get the key either using DPI or using TPM, right? So that, that gets, uh, makes things a little bit more, more difficult for the attacker. If it, it's in fallback mode, um, basically you don't have any other choice more than just go back to, to the option of or doing an offline cracking uh, of the pin uh, or, or something similar. So second scenario will be when the attacker is able to obtain a PCF file, again, by any means, uh, whatever, whatever it takes, uh, and the attacker is also able to get access to an SSO credential, right? So in this case, we have the PCF file that is encrypted, but we have something that holds the pin in an encrypted way, right? So depending on the way the SSO credential was stored, we can do, uh, for example, if the SSO credential is not protected using LPS, we can do some offline decryption using all their hard-coded keys. Or if it's using the DPA API, we will need to get local access to, to the box, right? So in a post-exploitation um, 
like a scenario, this might be the case where you got some level of access to a Windows box, for example. You can grab the PCI files, but you can also grab the encryption keys for, for decrypting those, right? So th this will be kind of the, the, the scenario. And in case of Windows systems that are joint domain, there's something interesting is that the data protection API store some kind of a backup key uh, for, for the DPI that gets like replicated in the Active Directory. So there might be also some ways of even if you don't have local access to the box, but you have some level of access to the domain, you can maybe <coughs> still grab some of these encryption keys, right? If the SSO credential is predicted with LPS, um, you don't have too many choices. If it's predicted with DP, as I say, uh, you need either to have local access or to use these recovery backup keys uh, in, in the Active Directory. Or if it's the TPM, I think that probably you need to have local access. I, I don't know of any, any way of extracting keys before having local access on, on a Linux book with a uh, like TPM chip uh, enabled and, and used for this. So this kind of summarizes two potential attack scenarios. Um, I implemented most of this in uh, the PySub tool. So basically, well, I, I will do a release of this probably at the end of this year, uh, along with some of the things that uh, Ivan presented early, early today. Uh, but basically, I implemented some support for reading and decrypting the SSO credential files, um, the PCF files in version 2, uh, and Using LPS, uh, you can use the tool also to decrypt on DPA uh, API mode. So uh, if you run the tool on a Windows box, you will be able to do this additional step of decrypting the pin um, from the data protection API. Uh, and I was also working in the last couple of days on implementing something to crack the PCF files because there's nothing available uh, around. Uh, so I, I might have maybe a, a John the Reaper plugin or Hashcat uh, plugin that can be used to, if you uh, grab somehow a PCI file uh, to decrypt it offline or, or, or do some similar stuff. So what's the business impact of this? Basically, if the attacker get access to the PCI files, it's possible to decrypt data that is stored in the database. Uh, again, this is common on, on financial models, uh, on um, <coughs> human resources, products, or, or things like that. Uh, there might be credit cards around that are store encrypted using some of these keys. There might be material uh, or, or product management uh, information that is also used, uh, um, store encrypted, uh, payroll data, or whatever. It's possible also if you get access to these type of files and to the keys to forge these signatures, right? So there are a lot of business processes that requires you to uh, sign some of the transactions or the things you, you do. Uh, in SAP GUI, for example, if you enable all this, you will get a prompt for the entering the PIN of the PCI file that you are using. Um, and basically, if you get access and you are able to crack the PCI files, you can bypass all, all that process, right? Uh, and actually make actual transactions or perform actions on behalf of some other users uh, when the digital, digital signatures are, are required, right? So finally, more on the technical side, if you get access to the files, what you can also do is, for example, inspect all the network traffic that is using HTTPS or SNLC or things like that. Uh, and you can use that data also to perform money in the middle or replay attacks uh, to impersonate a server or things like that. Basically, you are breaking all encryption and authentication layer um, at, the, at the network um, side, right? Um, another thing is that the servers in general trust each other using cross certificates, so you can also play with all the trace trust relationships between the different services and the different things if you get access not only to read the PCI files, but also to modify them, right? So there are a lot of things that someone can, can, can maybe do uh, if get access to, to these kind of things. So some recommendations. Um, 
basically, I think the more important thing is for everyone to understand uh, like what type of material you are storing in your systems uh, and how that is being protected. Uh, I think uh, this is something that hasn't been like a focus for, for a lot of people. So a lot of people jump into, okay, let's encrypt everything, but probably there's no one looking into how that is done, how the keys are protected, and, and things like that. Um, also, the distribution mechanisms in SAP system are quite interesting. So you got one file in one server that gets replicated to all the ones. So you're basically spreading all this crypto stuff on all over the place. Um, and I would say that the key management process that your company probably has needs to be applied to, to this type of thing also, right? For both the PCIs, the SSO credentials, um, and it should be like a store in a proper way. There should be some rotation mechanisms for make all, all this uh, work together to ensure that if a key got compromised at some point, uh, someone will lose the, the access using that keys and all, all that stuff, right? So the same that applies maybe to password to some other key management things uh, should be also here. Um, another recommendation is always store the PCIs encrypted, right? Even when there are some mechanisms to crack them, uh, it doesn't make sense to store uh, an encrypted PCI files. Use the strong pins. I think that that's the, the more important thing. And as much as possible, enable uh, LPS. Um, on Windows-based system is pretty straightforward. It's shown to be pretty strong also. Uh, on Linux, it's a little bit more complex because you need to have TPM modules available. And it's not something that is still that common on, on old servers. Uh, but I, I will still recommend to go into that direction, at, at least for critical uh, servers, uh, and avoid as much as possible the fallback mechanism. Um, final recommendations use always the latest common crypto lead version and configure the algorithms in the strongest way as possible. So those are like the options you can use in the common crypto leave uh, profile file uh, to specify the, the algorithms which are the stronger ones. Uh, and if you got all the PCF files encrypted with the old algorithms, my recommendation is also to re-encrypt them uh, and provide new ones uh, with uh, the strong um, encryption mechanisms. So to conclude and finish, uh, I think I'm, I'm close to, to the time. But I would say, well, the same that I said last year in my talk, crypto is hard. It's, it's, it's not something easy to implement in the right way. Uh, and just enabling encryption is not enough if you are not taking care of all these um, crypto material around. Uh, I would say also that knowledge is power. Understanding how things works makes you have more tools to, to protect uh, things. Uh, and also that there might be some practical ways of leveraging this, in particular for the pen testers or, or the security analysts trying to assess the level of security. Uh, having practical tools to, to play with some this stuff, I, I think is important, right? So uh, you can start having procedures like, uh, I don't know, testing if the pins are, 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 are stronger enough or things like that. Uh, so I would say that also having practical ways of leveraging all this um, is also a, a key part and I consider uh, an, important, uh, an important piece. So that's it. <laughs> So right. thank you, Martin, for providing that big picture. Um, we have time for two questions. OK, so you properly pointed out that encryption does not solve the problem of keeping data secret, but just moves the problem to the key, to the key store in that, fact, in that place. So then SAP moved it to the TPM uh, module. Now I'm wondering how is the TPM module protected because it has exactly the same issue, doesn't it? Yeah, the thing is, in, in general, TPM is a hardware thing. Yes, yes, of course it is hardware, yeah. but just because it's hardware doesn't mean it's more secure. It Again, the server, when it boots, does not know anything about its yeah. hardware. I think so it, it has somehow to discover and to figure out how to yeah. unlock the hardware. Yeah, what the TPM makes 
uh, a little bit harder is to perform offline attacks, right? So if you are in another machine and you get access to a PCF file, it's hard to, to, to I mean, if you got local access, it's, uh, you're, you're probably uh, gone, right? But if you are able as an attacker to extract the files from an external place, uh, having TPM or the data protection API in place make things a lot of more difficult because you need to crack uh, the key, right? So the key is not in the file. The key is in the TPM, right? So if you only grab the file, you still need to have some uh, cracking process to... Yeah, yeah, to, yeah I get the point. So if I can exfiltrate the data, that's not enough. But exactly. the my point was, if I get the CPU, if I get root access, or so if I own the operating system, then most probably, well, I, I have no clue about the TPM implementation. I would assume that I somehow can exfiltrate the key from the TPM, and this, yep. uh, if this you part have local I would access, like to, yep. to see as well. So yeah, this would if you be have very local access, see. Yeah. yeah, I think that the key, as, as you say, um, all these mechanisms helps when you are able to extract the data to make offline attacks uh, harder, uh, but yeah, definitely the challenge is still there if you have local access. Yeah. Okay, thanks again. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>